Let me tell you a story. So it's a story about a strategy, an approach, a philosophy, one that I've been thinking a lot about. And it starts with a guy that maybe you haven't heard of. Uh, his name is Dave Brailsford. And to set the stage for this, I want to tell you a little bit about British cycling. So about 15 years ago, early 2000s, British Cycling hires this guy named Dave Brailsford. And at that point, for the last like 100 years, uh, British Cycling had been incredibly mediocre. They had won a single gold medal back in 1908. They had never won a Tour de France, which is the premium race in cycling, the premier race. And so they, uh, they hired this guy named Dave Brailsford to change that. And in fact, at the time, they were so mediocre that when they went to buy a new set of bikes, they were gonna get like 200 from a top manufacturer in Europe. They actually weren't even given quotes from the manufacturer because they didn't want other teams to see the British riders using their gear uh, for fear that it would, it would hurt sales. And uh, so they brought Brailsford in, and they said, what's your plan for changing this? And he said, well, I believe in this philosophy that I call the aggregation of marginal gains. And the way that he described it is the 1% improvement in nearly everything that you do. So they started with a bunch of things that you would expect a cycling team to start with. So for example, they put slightly lighter tires on the bike. They got a more ergonomic seat for the riders to sit on. They had their outdoor riders wear indoor racing suits because they were lighter and more aerodynamic. They had each rider wear a biofeedback sensor so they could see how they would respond to training and then adjust it appropriately for the person. But then they did a bunch of things you wouldn't expect a cycling team to do. So, they split tested different types of massage gels to see which one led to the best type of muscle recovery. They taught each rider how to wash their hands to reduce the risk of infection so they wouldn't get a cold after, uh, you know, get, and get sick. They also figured out the type of pillow that led to the best night's sleep for each rider and then brought that on the road with them to hotels uh, whenever they were competing. And Brailsford said, if we can actually do this, right, if we can execute all these little 1% improvements, then I think we can win a Tour de France within five years. He ended up being wrong. They won it in two years. And then they repeated again the third year with a different rider. And then after a one year break, they won two more. So they've won four out of the last five now, have gone to British cyclists. But it was at the Olympics in London in 2012 when this kind of strategy really came to fruition. They won 70% of the gold medals available. And so this idea that small improvements, tiny habits, little choices are not just a cherry on top of our performance, not just like a nice thing to have, but actually can be the key that unlocks significant success, that's an idea that I want us to carry with us as we go through the rest of this presentation. And one way to think about it is just kind of basic math. Like if you just look at the numbers, if you were able to improve by 1% each day for an entire year, and those gains compound, you would end up 37 times better at the end of the year. And if you were to get 1% worse, you would whittle yourself almost all the way down to zero. And what we, what's interesting here is that everybody wants a transformation, right? Everybody wants a radical improvement, we want rapid success, but we fail to realize that small habits and little choices are transforming us every day already. That these times when you make a choice that is slightly better, slightly worse, a little mistake or a small error, 1% um, better or 1% worse, that these things compound over time. And habits are the compound interest of self-improvement. And so if you can learn to master those, then you can make time work for you rather than get against you, right? Good habits make time your ally. Bad habits make time your enemy. And so throughout the rest of this presentation, I want to talk about how we can do that. Today, I'm going to teach you how to build the habits that you need to get the results that you want. And in order to do this, I'm going to take you through a framework for building better habits. And then I'm also going to share a personal example of how I use this, so my writing habit. Uh, if you don't know, I write at jamesclear.com. I write about how to build better habits, improve performance, and uh, generally live better. Over a million people visit the site each month. There's over 400,000 subscribers on the weekly email newsletter. And it all came out of a simple writing habit. So for the rest of this talk, there are four stages of habit formation. I'm going to take you through each of those four. All right, so the four stages are noticing, wanting, doing, and liking. Noticing, wanting, doing, and liking. You cannot perform a habit or take an action if you do not notice something. I need to see a coffee cup sitting on the side in order to pick it up first. If it's not in my realm of knowledge, if I don't know it exists, I can't do anything about it. But then I need to want it. I need to want to drink coffee and pick it up. If I don't desire it or crave it, then I will not take the action. Then there's doing. You actually do the habit. And then I need to enjoy the reward. I need to enjoy drinking the coffee to repeat it again. 
Um, so noticing, wanting, doing, and liking. Let's talk about each one. And as we do this, I'm going to give you a little bit of research about why it works. I'm going to give you practical action steps, at least one for each, that you can use to implement in your life. So uh, one of my favorite things about noticing, one of my favorite strategies for discussing it, it's called implementation intentions. And there are hundreds of uh, studies on this, over 100 studies on implementation intentions, if you feel like geeking out and getting into the research. Um, but if not, I'll just give you the simple uh, version here. So one of my favorite studies is about exercise. And they had three cohorts in this study. So they have first cohort, they said, I just want you to track how often you work out over the next few weeks, right? So that's the, the um, standard cohort, the control group. Second group, they said, we want you to track how often you exercise. But we're also going to give you a motivation, motivational speech, presentation, talk about the benefits of heart health, why habits are good for you, and so on. So this is the motivated group, right? The third group, they got the same presentation, so they're equally motivated. And then they did one thing differently. And that one thing was they filled out this sentence. They said, during the next week, I will partake in at least 20 minutes of vigorous exercise on this day, in this at this time, in this place. Right? They specifically stated their intention to implement the behavior. So implementation intention. Here's what happened. First group, one out of three of them worked out. Second group, motivation did nothing. As soon as they left the researcher's facility the next day, they weren't motivated. It's like reading a book or watching a YouTube or listening to a motivational speaker, and then you forget all about it 20 minutes later. Um, but the third group, the group that had a specific plan for how they were going to implement the behavior, nine out of 10 of them worked out. So you can increase your odds of success two to three x just by having a specific plan. And this is the insight. Many people think that they lack motivation when what they really lack is clarity. They think that they need to get more motivated, that they need willpower in order to execute on a habit. If I just felt like writing, if I just felt like meditating, if I felt like working out, then I would do it. But in fact, they don't have a plan for it. And so they wake up each day thinking, I wonder if I'll feel motivated to write today. I wonder if I'll feel motivated to work out today. But instead, you can take the decision making out of it by explicitly stating when, where, and how you want to implement the habit. So here's how I did this with my writing habit. I decided that on November 12th, 2012, which was a Monday, if you check, um, that was going to be the first day that I published an article, and I was going to publish every Monday and every Thursday. That was my implementation intention. That was my specific plan. It didn't matter how good or how bad it was. It didn't matter how long or how short it was. It didn't matter how I felt about it. If all I could do was write three good sentences that day, then that was getting published. But I did that, and I did it for three years, and that was how the site grew. It was just that core habit that drove the growth. So you need to give your goals a time and a place to live in the world. Right? Give them space on your calendar. Now, it sounds easy to say, let's just start a plan. Let's you know, write down exactly what you should do, and then maybe you'll follow through on it. But of course, we all know that there are challenges that arise. It's not quite that easy. So here's a little strategy that I like to use to make sure you can come up with a better plan of action. And it's called a failure pre-mortem. So the way that it works is you think about the habit, the project, the goal, whatever the most important thing is that you want to work on. And then I want you to imagine, fast forward six months from now, and you failed. And then tell the story of why you failed. What happened? What challenges did you encounter? What was it that took you off course? Um, when I do this with businesses, sometimes we call it the kill the company exercise, because everybody just sits around and thinks about ways to kill the company in the next six months. And uh, once you have all that stuff laid out on the table in front of you, you can start to make better choices about how to develop a plan. You can start to have if-then plans. So not only do I want to exercise for 20 minutes on Monday at 5 p.m., but also if I do not exercise because I have to take my kid to practice or whatever, then it's Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. I will go in. Right? You can have ways to adjust for these challenges. So core point about noticing is it's hard to change something if you're not aware of it. And one way to become more aware of the opportunity to take action is to have a specific plan for when it's going to happen. All right, stage two, wanting. One of the most overlooked drivers of habits and human behavior is our physical environment. So let me tell you a quick story. This comes from Harvard. So these researchers at Harvard went to Massachusetts General Hospital, and they had a very interesting question. They wondered if they could change people's behavior without talking to them at all, without giving them anything to do, without trying to motivate them. But how can we shift their behavior without uh, asking them to do anything? And so they, this is a drawing of the cafeteria at the hospital. This is drawn to scale. Um, so. <laughs> The shaded pink boxes are areas where there are refrigerators that have soda in them. The two black boxes on the side are water, all right, refrigerators with water. And then all the other tables are food in the cafeteria. Now, they made a few little changes. They turned the 
pink boxes into ones that also had water. Okay, so they just added, but these refrigerators still have soda available. They just added water to it. And then they had a bunch of those little rolling carts, and they put those around the, um, the cafeteria too, so you can switch back and forth and see they, they just added a couple things. Now, what happened? They didn't talk to anybody, they didn't do anything, but over the next six months, people drank 25% more water and 11% less soda. And it's interesting because if you went up and talked to anybody sitting there and you asked them, why are you drinking this? Everybody would have a reason. They'd say, well, I felt like drinking soda. I felt like drinking water. But in fact, many of them chose to drink it simply because they were presented with it. And this is an interesting insight about our desires. Your environment often influences them. We want things simply, simply because they are an option, right? Simply because they are in front of us at the time. You walk into any living room in America, where do all the couches and chairs face? They all look at the TV. It's like, what is that room designed to get you to do? We wonder why we sit and watch so much TV, uh, and it's because our desires are shaped in that way. So thankfully, you don't have to be the victim of your environment. You can also be the architect of it. You can decide to design something to make your good behaviors easier and your bad behaviors harder. So when it comes to habits, if you want to practice your guitar more frequently, put it right in the middle of your living room so you run across it all the time. If you want to read more, when you make your bed in the morning, take the book you want to read, put it on top of the pillow. When you come back that night, pick it up, read a few pages, go to sleep. For me, I, uh, I used to buy apples all the time, and then I would put them in the crisper at the bottom of the fridge, and they would sit there for three weeks and go bad, and I'd finally open it up and see them again and get mad. And then eventually, I bought a bowl and put it right in the middle of the counter, and so then when I buy apples, I put them there, I see them every day, and now I eat them all the time. Um, many of our desires are simply shaped because we have an environment that shapes us in that way. So the moral of the story is I've never seen someone stick to positive habits in a consistent fashion in a negative environment. Maybe you can overpower it once or twice. Maybe you can have the willpower to do the right thing on one day. But if you're constantly fighting against those forces, it's going to be very hard to follow through. So don't rely on willpower and self-control. It's a lot easier to stick to better habits when you're presented with better options. All right, so what does this mean for writing? So one, I leave my phone in the other room, which it is in the other room right now, because I'd like to show it to you, so that's kind of a pain. Um, but uh, I also, on my home screen, have no applications. So you can't see anything. I have to swipe over and then tap into certain folders to get to social media. It takes at least three clicks for me to get to any social media app. It's not that big of a deal, but it just prevents me from being mindless and just pulling it up and tapping on Instagram because it's right in front of me. Um, and then I also uh, started something this last year, which has been really effective. My, every Monday, my assistant will log me out of all social media and reset the passwords, <laughs> and then not give them to me until Friday. And then on Friday, I get the passwords and get to enjoy social media again. Um, <laughs> also, I am going on vacation for the next two weeks, so if you see me posting on Tuesday, I don't want to hear about it, because I'm allowed to be on there. I'm not locked out <laughs> for this week. Right? So. Um, so the core idea here is that you want to put more steps between you and the bad behaviors and fewer steps between you and the good behaviors. And it is far easier to stick to good habits if you are living in an environment that is inclined to push you in that direction. All right, stage three, doing. So quick story here. There's this professor at the University of Florida. He's retired now. He was a photography professor. His name is Jerry Ullisman. And uh, at the beginning of the semester, he would have this film photography class, and he'd bring the class in, and he would split them into two groups. And he said, everybody on this side of the room, you are going to be graded on the quantity of work that you do this uh, semester. And everybody on this side of the room, you are going to be graded on the quality of work that you do this semester. And he further explained it by saying that for your film photography, you're going to be responsible for having 100 pictures. If you do 100 photos over the course of the semester, that'll be an A. If you do 90, it'll be a B. If you do 80, it'll be a C, and so on. So it's quantity. For this group, you only have to produce one photo, but it has to be the most perfect photo that you can make, the best photo that you can make. An interesting, an interesting thing happened. At the end of the term, all the best grades came from the quantity group, not from the quality group. And what ended up happening was that while people were busy experimenting, making mistakes, learning how to you know, play with composition and so on, they would come across a really great photo. And while the quality group was busy theorizing about what perfection would look like and how to take the perfect photo and not actually honing their skills, they ended up only making something mediocre or average. And the important insight here, especially for habits, is that in the beginning, the most important thing is just to shut up and put your reps in. Just make sure that you hone the skill, right? And you can start to think of it, the way that I like to think of it is that any outcome that you wish to achieve is just a point along the spectrum of repetitions. So if you have few reps to more reps, and you can imagine an easy goal, moderate goal, a hard goal, 
the more reps that you put in, the more that you more likely you, you are to achieve that goal. So maybe point A is, you know, let's take fitness, squatting 100 pounds. Point B is squatting 200. Point C is squatting 300. Maybe you need to put in 100 reps or 1,000 reps to get to point A. Maybe it's 5,000 to get to point B. Maybe it's 10,000 to get to point C. And this is actually very similar to what I saw with my writing habit. So after six articles, I had 100 subscribers. After 23, 1,000. After 96, 34,000, 177, 100,000, 243, and so on. And every rep that I put in, every article that I published, was something that was moving me closer to the next outcome on that spectrum. But you can't get around the fact that the repetitions matter. So every outcome is just a point along the spectrum. And this brings us to an interesting point, which is that if getting your reps in is incredibly important, then that means learning how to start is incredibly important. Because each repetition, really any consistency with the habit, is just an exercise in getting started each day. If you can get started over and over again, then that's what consistency is. So you need to make it as easy as possible to start. I want to give you a little strategy for doing that. Um, I like to call it the two-minute rule. Now, this is adapted. So David Allen has a two-minute rule for productivity. And his rule is that if it takes two minutes, just do it now. So like throwing in the laundry or washing a dish or calling somebody back. If it takes two minutes or less, just do it right away. Don't plan it. Don't wait. Just do it now. Now, for many of the habits and behaviors that we want to perform, they're going to take longer than two minutes. You know, if you go to the gym, you're not going to work out for just two minutes. But any habit can be started in less than two minutes, whether it's writing, working out, meditating, anything. And so the goal here is that you want to optimize for the beginning of the, the task. You want your habits to act as an entrance ramp to a bigger routine. One of my favorite examples is this, Twyla Tharp, great choreographer and dancer. She said that she had a two hour workout routine that she did every morning, but the habit was not the workout routine. The habit was she would wake up, walk down to the street, and then hail a cab. And that was the only thing she focused on. And as long as she hailed the cab and got in the car, she knew that she was gonna end up at the gym and then do the rest of the workout. So she put all of her energy into starting. Now. What I like to say is you should optimize for the starting line, not the finish line. Right? So often when we think about habits, goals, routines, achievements, it's all about the milestone. We think about how much weight we want to lose, how much money we want to earn, how many subscribers we want to have. It's all fixed on the finish line. But instead, if you can optimize for the starting line and make it as easy as possible to get started and get your reps in, often the outcomes just come as a natural result. OK, stage four, liking. So, the only reason that we repeat behaviors is because we enjoy them, because we like the reward. If we don't enjoy the experience along the way, we're unlikely to stick with it. And that means that you need to figure out ways to bring a reward into the present moment because good habits have a problem. And that problem is that for good habits, the immediate consequence is there. There's a cost that happens in the moment, but the reward is often delayed. If I go to the gym now, it's cost me time and energy and effort, but the reward is I'll be fit three months from now or not get sick 10 years from now or so on. The reward is delayed. Bad habits are often the reverse. If I eat a donut right now, the benefit is it tastes great and I get a hit of sugar and it's awesome, and the consequence is delayed, right? I get overweight three weeks from now or three months from now or so on. So you need to figure out how to bring the reward into the present moment to stick to a good habit. And someone else who's going to be speaking here, Seth Godin, had a very nice little quote about this where he said, the best way to change long-term behavior is with short-term feedback. And one way to think about that is that long-term behaviors, sticking with writing for years on end or going to the gym and so on, they, they have those delayed consequences. So you need a way to enjoy it in the moment. All right, there are many ways to do this, but I'm just going to share one today. I like to call it the Seinfeld strategy. And the story uh, is from Jerry Seinfeld, famous comedian. Early in his career, he's speaking at a comedy club. He's presenting or you know, performing that night. And uh, this guy named Brad Isaac is opening for him. And backstage, Brad Isaac catches Seinfeld. And he said, Mr. Seinfeld, huge fan of yours. Do you have any tips for a young comic? Do you have any recommendations for how to be better? And Seinfeld thought for a second. He said, well, the secret to being a better comedian is to write better jokes. And the secret to writing better jokes is to writing every day. So here's what I think you should do. Get a wall calendar where you can see every day of the year mapped out on it. And then any day that you do your task of writing jokes for 15 minutes, I want you to just put an X on that day. And you'll have a couple false starts here and there, but at some point you're going to get a little bit of a chain going, right? You get four, five, six, seven, eight days in a row. And at that point, your only goal becomes to don't break the chain. It doesn't matter how good or how bad the jokes are. It doesn't matter if it makes it into your material. Just don't break the chain. And uh, What's interesting about this is that by measuring your progress, you get an immediate reward in the moment. Right? The reward of like having a great stand-up routine 40, you know, 40 days from now or 40 weeks from now or whatever, 
is not, that it's so delayed that you need something in the moment that makes you feel good. So if you do those 15 minutes, you can cross that off. That's a way to get an immediate hit, a little bit of a reward by tracking it. Now, I like to do, add, I like to add one more thing to this, which is never miss twice. So many people, they'll get a chain going, and then they fall off track, and they feel bad about it. They feel like, oh, I, you know, I ruined it. I had this great thing, and now it's over. The streak is gone. But what you find when you look at top performers is not that they don't make mistakes. They make mistakes just like everybody else, but they can just get back on track more quickly. And in fact, if you could just adhere to this one rule, never miss twice, then you would, you know, even if you fell off track every single time after you got back on track, you still would do it 50% of the time. Um, and so this basic strategy is very useful. And I've seen people use the Seinfeld strategy for, you know, working out. I used it for tracking how often I was writing every Monday, every Thursday. I didn't want to break the chain. Uh, I have videographer friends who every day that they do 30 minutes of video processing, that's their X. So you can adapt it for almost anything. All right, so the four stages, noticing, wanting, doing, liking. Now, I'd like to close by talking about why habits are so important. And to do that, uh, I want to share a little story about the ship of Theseus, which is this ancient Greek parable story about this ship that goes into Athens, Greece, and parks in the dock. And as it's there, it's used year after year. Some of the boards start to wear away. Some of them start to go bad. And so whenever one board is bad, they take the board out and change it and put a new one in. This process continues for 25 or 30 years until every board that is on the ship has been changed out for a new one. And philosophers for centuries have asked, is this the same boat? Is this the same thing that was there before? Is both entirely the same and entirely new? And I would say that your habits can be the same way. We often fear that in order to achieve something new, to become someone new, we have to abandon everything that we are. But in fact, that's not how it works. Change can happen plank by plank, board by board, habit by habit, and gradually, you can become someone new. With consistency and repetition, you can actually change not only your results, but actually your identity. And the reason that this is true is because the more evidence that we have for a belief, the more likely we are to believe it. So if you go to church every Sunday for 20 years, you believe that you are religious. If you study Spanish every Thursday night for 20 minutes, you believe that you are studious. The actions that you take provide evidence for who you are. And it's not that Habits matter more necessarily on an individual basis. Each moment in life matters. But what ends up happening is that over the broad span of time, things that you do once or twice fade away, and things that you do time after time, day after day, week after week, accumulate the bulk of the evidence for what you believe about yourself. And so every action that you take is actually a vote for the type of person that you want to become. If you want to become someone new, then you can take a new action and begin to accumulate evidence for that identity, for that belief about yourself. And that the more votes that you cast, the more likely you are to win the election. You don't need to be unanimous. You don't have to be perfect all the time. You just need to have the body of work, right? So true change is actually not behavior change. It's not results change. It's not process change. It's identity change. The goal is not to become, the goal is not to read a book. It's to become a reader. The goal is not to write a book or write an article. It's to become a writer. The goal is not to run a marathon, it's to become a runner, to become a type of person, to develop an identity. And the way to being something or becoming someone is through doing something. So every time you sit down to write, every time you practice that habit, you are being a writer. Every time you play a sport, you're being an athlete. Every time you practice painting or music or whatever, you're being an artist. Your identity emerges out of the habits that you have. And so here's the secret to this talk. It's not just about getting you to make small changes. It's not just about putting a book on your pillow or putting an apple on the counter. It's actually about getting you to believe something new about yourself, something possible about yourself. And habits are not only the method through which we achieve external measures of success, like losing weight or gaining more, earning more money or meditating and reducing stress. They are also the path through which we achieve internal change and actually become someone new. They're the path through which we forge the identity that we have, the deepest beliefs we have about ourselves, our sense of self. And so if you can change your habits, you can change your life. Thank you.